Very few Christians in all history have impacted the world like Bob Pierce. As the founder of World Vision and later Samaritan's Purse, Bob impacted literally millions of lives around the globe for good through both evangelism and relief and development. That legacy continues to this day. But even as Bob led world-changing work of justice and mercy around the world, he profoundly neglected other things of immense importance, including his marriage and three daughters and the health of his own body and soul, ultimately with tragic consequences. To be honest, when I first heard about all this, I was angry. It seemed to me the most dastardly of hypocrisies to champion the gospel and health and healing all over the world, and yet fail to live it in your own home. Now I would say I realize that this is something every single one of us can fall prey to. It isn't that we don't believe what we say or are working for publicly. It is that we can become so caught up in good things, in noble work, in important ministry, that we neglect God's call to love those nearest to us, and also fail to receive the care that He wants to provide for us. We imagine that our ministry, with a capital M, is more important than small acts of love at home. Our sense of identity as doers for God completely drowns out our deeper identity as beloved children of God. We find our sense of value in what we achieve out there, rather than in relationships that matter most, with God and with our family and with close friendships. Living here in the Washington, D.C. area, I can say for sure that this region is full of people who are champions for wonderful programs and ideals on a global scale, whether in ministry or secular nonprofits or government or other things, and yet often fail to reflect those same ideals in their small daily choices. The truth is, we can all do the same. Today, we get to explore both the beauty and the heartbreak of the story of Bob Pierce through the eyes of his wise, loving daughter, Marilee Dunker. She loved her father dearly and continues to honor him and his legacy. For the past two decades, she's been an advocate for vulnerable children and families through the organization that Bob founded seven decades ago. But Marilee also is unflinchingly honest in describing what happens when we put external ministry above the care of our soul and the people that God has placed right around us each day. Merrily ultimately reminds why justice work and the inner life must always remain together if we are to live the life that God intends. to Justice and the Inner Life, presented by the Christian Alliance for Orphans. Together, we'll explore what it takes to sustain a heart of justice and mercy over a lifetime. Here is your host, Jed Medefit. Marilee Dunker, I feel privileged to have this conversation with you. Welcome to Justice and the Inner Life. Thank you so much. It's my joy to be here. Well, um, let's just jump right in. Uh, You know, since... Your early childhood, you have really been right at the center of the, the, the heart of advocacy and service to orphans, to families and others in, in deep need. Um, particularly as your father, Bob Pierce, was founding and building World Vision. Um, and, you know, it, it strikes me, Marilee, so many people who are in that cauldron of of all that comes with deep, intense ministry like that often come out as adults, either viewing that experience and speaking about it in exclusively positive terms uh, or very bruised by it and and sometimes even angry. And I, I was just so struck by how your book and, and other speaking that you've done over the years has woven together both the beauty of ministry like that and the, the wonderful experience when you see God working and you get to be a little part of that. Um, and yet right alongside that, also speaking just very frankly, um, 
about the pains, painful consequences that can happen when we engage this work uh, without a sense of our finiteness or limits or healthy rhythm, rhythms that God calls us to live within. And so I'd, I'd love to explore that together. And um, let's start with the beauty of that. And, and I would just love to hear, you know, what, what do you recall as some of the sweetest memories of your childhood with your father founding World Vision and building it to impact so many lives for good? Well, honestly, the memories I have with my dad growing up were all pretty much related to ministry as uh, because he was only home literally about nine or 10 months every year. And I mean, excuse me, he traveled nine or 10 months every year. So uh, his times at home were very often focused around uh, preaching and uh, movies that he made. My dad made 12 full length documentary movies that really uh, he used to communicate his message in the churches. And that really gave World Vision its first uh, exposure to the church and his preaching, of course. So I would go with him. My family would go with him. And my my sweetest memories are probably uh, being in a church service or a huge mega service and listening to my dad preach. And I, I saw his passion for God. And I saw that his relationship with God was personal. I mean, my dad loved Jesus. And when he communicated that, he poured his heart out to the people he was speaking to. He was, you know, he and Billy Graham came up at the same time. They were dear friends. They worked together from day one. But his style was quite different than Billy's. His message always came from the heart. My mom used to say, uh, you know, Bob would drive me crazy because uh, he'd be writing his key points down on a napkin, you know, before he was walking into church uh, to preach. It was never a canned message. And so I think that really impacted me to uh, see my dad uh, as as truly a, a follower of Christ a communicator of the good news and a challenger. He was a tremendous challenger of people, not just to receive what God had to give them, but then to use that to bless others. What are you going to do about it? That was his message. And then he would give people practical ways to respond. And I think that that's something that we can learn, that we can challenge people, but if we don't show them what to do, what's the next step? What can I do? I can't change the world but I can do something. My dad was very gifted at understanding how to get people to begin their journey of giving. How do I make a difference? And that was something I learned from my dad is to communicate the gospel. You need to respond, communicate the challenge. You need to respond. And so that's not really personal. That's not daddy taking me on his lap and reading me a story. I wish I had more of those. But I didn't really know my dad, but I knew his ministry. I knew his heart. So those, I would have to be traveling with him, being able to be with him in some of the places, traveling around the world with him. And he would take me with him when he spoke in the States. And those were my most precious memories of my father. And when you think about that, the legacy of the ministry, part of his life, and of course, World Vision was formed in 1950. Right. And I, I believe you were born in the same year as World Vision. Born the same year. Yes. Uh, she <laughs> was a much more demanding baby than I was. <laughs> <laughs> and so you look at the scope of, of that, uh, all that has grown from that, from Samaritan's Purse, which he was right at the center of founding and growing as well. What do you see as the most significant um, part of, of his legacy? I think that... Um, what we uh, he, that he inspired others to follow their vision. My dad was a seed planter, and when World Vision began, we were not really an entity unto ourselves. In my dad's day, we were a support mechanism for missionaries and churches and lay people who were out there doing the ministry on the ground. So we supported missionaries and churches and ministry around the world and gave them the ability to do what they were doing better. And when child sponsorship began, 
those were children that were being taken care of in church homes, in community homes, in, in, in places where people were gathering children together and taking care of them. We rarely started an orphanage when my dad was with World Vision or, or created the program. We came in as a support mechanism, a funding mechanism, and as a voice for all these voiceless, countless people out there doing the work of the kingdom. My dad called them the unsung heroes of the cross. And so today World Vision functions in a different way, and it's just as wonderful and impactful. But in my dad's time, it was the people he enabled to follow the vision God had given them. And today those ministries have multiplied and there are tens of thousands of them out there today. And that's what my new book will be about all the way the seed was planted, all the way the partnerships were created and the way God used that to build his kingdom. And today we see that fruit. So the greatest legacy is all the fruit my dad has enabled to grow up around the world and the lives of the children that we've supported who have grown up and impacted their world and the families we've enabled to be healthy and strong. There's so much out there to celebrate when you look at what my parents speak in. Well, you know, I, I told you this when you were talking earlier, Marilee, but, uh, you know, a, a dear mentor of mine recommended that book to me and really said, this needs to be required reading for every Christian leader. Um, and after reading it, I understood why. And it, it, it impacted me deeply. It continues to impact me deeply. And um, I think in large part because it contains such a blend of the beauty that we find in serving Christ amidst the world's brokenness, as well as um, the, 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 as we talked about earlier, the deep consequences when we do that in a way that isn't recognizing our limitations and the healthy rhythms that God may call, I believe, God calls his people to live yeah. with as they do that. And so let's let's talk about that because you you are very forthright in sharing some of the really hard parts of the journey too, from just your dad's frenetic pace and and the co near constant absence, um, and you know forms of physical and emotional burnout, and then the ultimate breakdown of your parents' marriage and even his relationships with World Vision, and and, and so just tell us about. Just what, what do you see as the core tragedy in all of those things? Well, um, first of all, people give me credit for writing this enormously uh, honest book. But uh, the truth is, it was just nobody ever told me I wasn't supposed to tell the truth. So I did. I, I told the story. Uh, from my point of view as a daughter who watched, you know, for 20, 20, almost 30 years, uh, what was happening. And then I sat at my mother's feet and learned the early part of the story. And because she never threw one of my dad's letters away, I was able to also see the journey through his eyes and the letters that he wrote. So I feel that both my parents' voice are fairly, uh, you know, given in, in my book. I want them both to be honored. I love them very much and I admire them both deeply. And they have surely given me a, a blessing and a legacy of their lives and their ministry and their faith. But I think that uh, because God had chosen Bob and Lorraine Pierce to truly change the world, you know, we all say we want to be world changers. Well, we all do change the world, every one of us. And I, I give a good teaching on that because I don't care who you are, you change the world for the good or for not good. But my parents were chosen to do something huge and uh, because they were imperfect and because they didn't know that they had been given this amazing uh, assignment as young men and women, uh, they struggled tremendously in the early years of their marriage. And I think a lot of what they went through later in life when it was required that they be separated a lot, not as much as they were. I will say that nobody needs to be gone from his family these days, nine or 10 months a year. But you have to remember how, what travel was like in my dad's time, taking those old big uh, prop airplanes. And it would take four or five days to get to the Orient 
not a few hours. And so, and communication was so poor. And there were many, many challenges to what uh, God called my dad to do. But there were also wrong choices. And I think the great tragedy in many of the things that I watched in my parents' lives and then could look back on as an adult, a parent of my own children and a wife, a lot of it was unnecessary. And when I look at my dad's life in particular, I think the things that I see is he was part of a generation of world changers. They all started together in Youth for Christ, Billy Graham, and you can just name dozens of others that uh, they were all friends. They were all prayer warriors together. They went out to change the world for Jesus and, and bring the gospel to the entire world. But in that, there was a sense that it was God first, ministry second, family third. And that is not what the Bible teaches. And what God says is, you worship me first. I go above all things. Then if you have a family, if I give you a wife and children, and even if you're not married, you have parents, you have brothers and sisters, you have people God gives to you in a special way to be your people. And you are accountable to them and they depend on you. And those are the people God says, that's your first mission field. That's your priority. You train up your children to love me and serve me and not to resent me, not to blame me because daddy was never there or mommy. Now it's mommy and daddy. And, and my dad came up in a generation when there are so many children who fell by the wayside, not because they weren't loved. My dad loved me, but he would literally preach on this and he is recorded as saying I made an agreement with God if he'll take care of my little lambs at home that was me my sister Sharon my sister Robin I will take care of his little lambs overseas see that was that was not biblical ground my dad was building from a false premise but it was one that many people applauded and admired and said oh that's amazing Everybody but my mom, who was left alone like a widow. She was an evangelical widow because my dad was off taking care of everybody else's children. But he wasn't home for his own. And you cannot have a healthy relationship if you're not spending time together. I don't care how much time you spend on the Internet. I don't care that you can Zoom today. I don't care that, you know... Uh, what you're doing is critically important. I would say this. My dad did not understand healthy boundaries. My dad didn't have anyone really in his life holding him accountable. And most people who are married know the spouse is rarely the one that can step in and truly hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. You need others in your life that you respect and trust and listen to. Yes. My dad had no one in his life that was that mentor, that person who could step in and say, Bob, you're out of balance. You need to be home more, not just for your family's sake, but for your health's sake. And so I look, my dad burned out at 63. No, excuse me. My dad burned out at 55. He died at 63. And it wasn't necessary because that's not what god requires so i think we need to know the checks and balances in life even in ministry i say this the reason god brought me to world vision and i was there for 20 years preaching the same message all around the world to our staff with the approval of leadership sometimes our staff would come up to me when i would say you need to turn the lights off and go home at five o'clock you need to be home on the weekends. Don't take your laptops. They would come and say to me, do they know what you're saying? And I'd say yes, because they don't want you to burn out. You know, it doesn't make sense. God said we're to be the light of the world. But my dad would say, just let me burn out for Christ. Words are powerful. 
He did. But you and I don't have to. Mm. And I think that one of the great legacies that my parents have left is their story. Yes, both the beauty of the things of the fruit grown, but also the truth that we all need to grapple with. And, yes. you yes. know, I, I'm struck by the fact that while, while I think some of the excesses of that era, and as you described, that generation of passionate world changers, some of the excesses um, are likely more likely to be avoided today. I think some of that same sense that I need to change the world, and by that they mean not faithfully loving the people in front of me, but going and doing something far off or huge in scale and scope, that, that is still alive and well. I think it's um, perhaps you could say one of the the the, the um, dangers within the evangelical movement among, amidst all its strengths and good things is that pull towards feeling like we have to go out and do something grand for God rather than being simply faithful and loving well those those things right in front of us. Does, yeah. does it seem that way to you? I mean, is it? Yes. Well, I, I, first of all, I think there's far too few of us that are uh, standing up and getting out there and realizing we don't need to do grand things for God. We need to let God do grand things in us. Mm. And then out of the overflow of that, grand things will happen. Yes. yes. I mean, all I need to do is look at my own life and see how God has led me. I'm nobody. I never graduated from college. My dad never graduated from college. God chose the most unlikely person in the world to go out and do the kind of world-changing work that Bob Pierce did. My mom had to teach him what fork to use at the dinner table. This was not a cultured, educated, highbrow man. This was salt-of-the-earth man who had lived a very hard life and gone through some of the suffering and pain that uh, as an orphan in his own life. And, and then took that pain and saw it in the children overseas in Korea and China and the Philippines and Taiwan and India and, and Africa and saw that same pain that God had allowed him to go through and related. And I, he has said himself, I think the reason I cared so passionately is that I saw me. I thought it was to be a child left alone, to be an adult far too early and have to struggle with those things. And everything we've been through, I don't care what it is. God's allowed it for a purpose. I've been through some terrible things. If you read my book, you will find out God allowed some terrible things to happen in my family. And just because the book ended doesn't mean my life ended. My life has gone on. And the challenges have been terrific. But so have the blessings. Why? I think it's because at the worst of times, I just grabbed hold of Jesus and didn't let go. How do you do that? This is critical because if you are in Christian ministry, you will spend a lot of time teaching other people how to do this. But often you will neglect doing it yourself. Mm. And I have told our staff and I've told pastors conferences and challenged them. As shepherds, are you doing what you preach? Mm. Are you spending time alone with God and letting him actually speak to you? Or are you always talking, telling him what you need, telling him what he should be doing? Mm. Instead of listening, saying, God, what do you want to teach me today? Mm. Are you in the word significant amount of time? Not just going through your daily reading. Whoops, done. Are you feeding your soul? And are you letting God tell you great and mighty things that you know not by spending time with him? He says, call upon my name. Right now, we need God to speak to us. That was something my father and mother both role modeled for me. Prayer. Are you on your knees? And I don't mean just telling God your wish list, but really on your knees, repenting, worshiping, talking to God, letting him talk to you. 
Because if you're not maintaining those uh, things in your life, you will find you will run out of gas. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be, and I'm, I'm not saying you, <laughs> but I'm saying all I us, don't want us, to be, yeah. I, I don't want to be one of those people who is communicating something that's becoming empty for me. Well, it, it, it just strikes me that the greatest loss and, and tragedy of all would be to continually point people to Jesus and remind them that in Christ, everyone is a new creation and that there is life to the full to be found there and, and even help people enter into that and yet continually be not living it ourselves day, yes. day after day. Yeah. And, and nobody intends to do that. That's not what we intend. We don't go that way. My dad didn't intend to forsake his family. I'm in a church right now that's very active, very uh, amazing, spirit-filled and powerful. But uh, our, our pastors do a, uh, a, a checklist with one another every month. How am I doing? Mm. Just to sit down and hear what your partner has to say. And they do it with their kids. Mm. And I think, you know, if my dad had ever thought to sit down with us and say, how am I missing it? I know I'm gone a lot. What am I not seeing? What do I need? Oh, man, we would have been bowled over. Mm. And we could have helped him mm. see where he was uh, overdoing. And that, what a reminder that this problem endemic to ministry and leadership yes. in the name of God yes. has that constant pull towards the excess of labor, labor, work relentlessly, be caught up in this grand vision and neglect to love and care for those nearest to you or do those things that are most important. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and it was Moses too, right? That later on he was burning himself uh, at the candle at both ends and his father-in-law Jethro comes to him and says, yes. hey, Moses, you need to slow down. You need to delegate more. Um, and, and thankfully Moses listened and did, did change gears there. Yes. And I think that that was a huge, uh, also the thing that my dad just did not understand. And, and, and he had no role models for this. They were all this way. It was an amazing generation. They did incredible things for God, but, but there was a lot of damage done. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of them burned out. Many of them had bad health issues. And, um, because balance and rest, God rested on the Sabbath, on the seventh day. And the concept of rest for rest's sake, not because you don't have anything else to do, not because it's convenient, but because without it, you will not be able to finish the race. Mm -hmm. Bob Pierce did so much in a mere 25 years with his life. What could he have done if he lived another 25? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 71, and I think, oh, my goodness, if my dad had just lived to be my age, what else would we have seen that God would have used him to do? Mm. Yeah. And I just, I just feel that uh, we have to understand we are precious to God, and that's true of all of our children. Mm. Mm. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of of the most precious gift God has given us. And that's our children and now grandchildren. Yes. And it's <laughs> such a blessing mm. to see the legacy of faith and passion to serve being passed down through not only my children, but my grandchildren. Mm. That's marvelous. Well, you know, it, it strikes me, Marilee, you, you of course describe how your father died at 63, that he in many ways burned out at 55 and yes. that, you know, certainly there, there's a deep tragedy and just the loss of productive and fruitful years that could have, you know, been from six to 65, 75. Who knows uh, how many years further had he been in just greater health? But perhaps an even greater loss is just that he could have walked his years of ministry with greater joy, yes. uh, with greater peace, that your family could have had a, an entirely different experience through those years. And and perhaps, although he would have worked less, even greater fruit could have come from those years. I, I really want to make this point, too. And, and you said it earlier. 
um, while my dad was great at inspiring others to, to fulfill their passion and go for it, you know, really so many ministries are the fruit of, of things my dad began or helped to begin, but he was not a good delegator. You know, Moses needed to learn to delegate. My dad was the voice of world vision, the face of world vision, the primary fundraiser for world vision. He had the movies going. He was the visionary. Uh, he had so many hats and he guarded them. They were his. And the idea of releasing, you know, some of that to other people. And the other thing that is sad in a way is that there were probably others that would have stepped up and had an amazing experience, you know, being able to be released to take charge of certain mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there was opportunity missed and, uh, and it would have released my dad to feel like, okay, I don't have to worry about that because God has chosen another person to oversee that. Mm. And that would have been, you're right, giving him more joy in in the ministry yeah. rather than stress. Yes. I, I You, you want to ask me one of my greatest pictures of my dad is him preaching, but just sweat. You know, it was like everything was so critically important. My dad was just gave every ounce to everything. That's great. As long as you're refilling the tank. Mm -hmm. yeah. He didn't know how to refill the tank. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is just a, it's like a law of spiritual physics that if we continue yes. to pour out and pour out and pour out without yes. enabling, taking those times to enable God to pour in, then we will very swiftly run dry. We are very finite creatures. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it strikes me that, that so much of the, that relentless drive to never stop, it is the, 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 the strange sensation and false belief we have that it all depends on us, right? That it's, yes. it's all on my shoulders. And if I stop working, somehow the work of God in this world will fall short. Rather than just saying, hey, my good father is at work in this world and I just get to join him and I'll join him when it's my time to join and I'll rest when he calls me to rest and I don't have to worry about the outcomes. They're so free. And, and yes, it is. And I think, you know, the stories that I'm going to share in my new book, which is the audacity of faith. I would ask for prayer that I can get this finished because it's been in my, it, it's been uh, in the womb for seven years and <laughs> one day. Pregnancy. Yeah, I know it is, but, but God keeps adding to it. And so I know that uh, the time is right to, to give this uh, out into the world, but all the people who partnered together, the power of partnership. And that is one of the things I think God wants to teach us again. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. World Vision is very good at this today in coming in and finding out who's doing something. That's what my dad would do. Who's doing something here about this? He'd see a need. Is there anybody doing anything? You're doing something. I can help you. And, you know, the partnership, you're not losing anything to partner with someone. You become less. See, we're so afraid we're going to become less. They're going to become more. No, God will be glorified. God is the one who's doing this. So the power of partnership is something I really uh, am trying to show in my book mm. because partnership, when two or three come together, one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. You get 10 people going at the same time. You change the world. And, and so the power of, of finding those people who have the same heart and the same vision or a similar vision and coming together and not having to do it all alone. Mm. That's a huge part mm. of what I believe we need to get back to. And then I, I just see that we need to be humble. Be, you know, the word says, humble yourself before the mighty hand of God, that he will lift you up and give you a life of significance. And I think maybe we need to change our thinking from, I want to do big, great things for God. To, I want to do significant things for the kingdom of God. 
And that can look very different from what you do and I do. Yeah. But every part is essential, important, and needed. So let's think about being significant rather than big. Mm, that's so good, Marilee. Yes. And marvelously freeing. Because I, I do think many very good people, earnest Christ followers, drive themselves to exhaustion because they believe that to to be responsible, to be faithful, to the world's great need, they have to go out and do something on a massive scale or something that feels like world changing rather than saying, like you said, I want to do something significant for God's kingdom. And in the course, in the eyes of God, he says, giving a cup of water to a child is significant. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a, a healthy sense of our smallness, I guess, right? Yeah. Saying I, I can yeah. just be a, a little child in my father's workshop I can serve faithfully, whether that's in the neighborhood or the other side of the world or raising some funds to support good work. But I can do that faithfully while, while just leaving the rest in God's hands. That's right. That's right. And then I think it's also uh, believing that God is who he says he is. I have seen God work miraculously in my life in so many ways. One day I will write my own book. It will be entitled Confession of a Christian Princess, <laughs> and it will uh, give me a chance to talk about all the great things God has done in me and through me and for me in my life. But when I look at my dad and his generation, they were men and women who believed God was who he said he was and that God would do what he said he would do. And they staked their lives on it. They were willing to die if that's what it took and so what i'm talking about here when i say balance and and healthy um boundaries and 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 prioritizing your family i'm not talking about not stepping out like um you know uh the uh, stepping out in faith believing that god's going to open doors that cannot be opened believing those things with all of your heart because that is sometimes what's necessary. And I believe that with all my heart. And I believe we need a generation of young men and women to step up and step out with that same kind of audacious faith. Marilee, I love the combination that you're talking about. You're not talking about a comfortable, well-padded, you know, self-preserving life. You're talking about laying it all on the line being willing to risk everything, including life itself, while at the same time receiving the care that God wants to provide in our lives and setting, understanding our smallness with a humility and our finiteness um, that in that self sets healthy limits that enables us to both persevere in this work for the long haul, but, but also while we're in the midst of it, to take joy in it. Um, not constantly be exhausted and frustrated and, and all of those things. What, what do you feel like your dad needed most to be able to do that? He had the first part of that as well as just about anyone I, I've you know, heard of since the Apostle Paul, perhaps. The second part of that, he, while he saw the importance of that for others, he, he often didn't do that himself. Um, what, what do you think he needed to be able to do that? I, I really believe, again, the word accountability is huge. Mm -hmm. You have got to have people in your life that will tell you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. And if you don't have that, pray. Mm -hmm. God will send them to you because they are essential. And that you're probably going to find them in your church or in your small prayer group or sometimes in somebody else who has a similar vision. And the two of you can do that for one another. But but that is really important. My dad did not have that. And I also believe that, you know, be in a church environment that is a family. Mm. Because I believe having your whole family in church and having the kind of teaching from the word of God that builds you up, but also <laughs> keeps you humble before God. I mean, I, I don't know why. It seems like we have one teaching or the other. Mm -hmm. But but I want the kind of teaching that my, you know, my, that I remember in my dad's time. 
that was, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But we will stay on our knees humbly before the cross and remember what it cost God to give us this privilege. Those are the things that I think are truly important. And also feed yourself with the right messages. You know, there's so much out there to help people understand what's healthy and what's not. Yes, my book is a really good beginning to open conversation. And I really think if my, like I said, if my dad had just had the wisdom to sit down with us with an open mind and an open heart and hear whether he was hitting the mark with us. And we, we all need to do that with our families. We all have to say, you know, I think I'm doing a good job. But if I'm not, let me know. Mm-hmm. And, and be prepared. You got teenagers? <laughs> They're going to let you know. <laughs> and, and I will say, you don't have to take everything. Take everything with a grain of salt because some <laughs> things are simply hormonal. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. But as you said, you, you mentioned just the importance of how immensely significant it would have been for you if your dad had sat down with you and, and your, your mom and your sisters and said, Hey, where, where am I falling short? What are you, what are you seeing and feeling right now? And been attentive to what you shared yeah. and responded to that. It would have been so deeply meaningful to you and, and probably changed the course of his, his life. If he had really listened to that. Yeah. Yeah. There's a great book. I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with boundaries mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that uh, I'm sorry, right now I know it's, it's McLeod and oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, another person wrote it. It changed my life because of it releasing me to say no. Mm. No was a word that wasn't in my dad's vocabulary Mm -hmm. because somehow he felt saying no was letting God down. You know, if somebody asked you to do something, must be God. No, it isn't always God. We need to pray and understand what our assignment is and just what is frosting on the cake. And, 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 Really, you have to learn discernment about those things. When, when you are in the midst of a growing ministry and everything seems life and death, it's not. It's the way we perceive it. But if God's called you to something, now I'm not saying there won't be times. We talk about that in World Vision. There are times when it's all hands on deck. You know, this pandemic has caused a lot of pain and suffering. And so there's things that we are called to. If there's a, 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 you know, a catastrophe of some kind or refugees running from war, sometimes it's all hands on deck for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to move the boundaries out. But explain that to your family. Say, I may be distracted. I may not be here. You know, I'm sorry. I'm going to say sorry ahead of time. But no, it won't always be like this. It will move back to what's healthy. Well, Marilee, we've we've touched on some very tangible, practical things, talking about accountability for any leader to have at least a few, at least one close friend who can just no holds barred, just lay it out. Hey, I want to challenge you on this. So having that those types of relationships, listening well to our families. Um, you, you've also at least alluded to that the idea of um being able to step back and allow others to step in so that whether that's in a, in a form of delegation, so just sharing responsibilities or even leaving times when, hey, maybe we just step back, even if there's no one obvious to delegate to, but knowing that God is calling us to step back, to have a rhythm of rest with a Sabbath or to, to take time away with our family and just leaving space for others to step forward. So those are all very tangible things that I think are of immense value I I wanted to ask what you feel might have been just deep in the heart of of the what was driving your father's overwork in this. You know, I I just speaking very transparently of myself, I know so often even in the best of work, even in ministry, even in wonderful noble things, I can still often seek to find my identity in in achievement and doing great things for God or or being viewed by others with respect. 
uh, wanting to be admired for, for, for achieving things for God. And, and there's always the mix of motives in there, right? Some of it is indeed pure for God, and some of it is about my sense of identity and reputation. But I'm wondering, do, do you feel that that was something your dad struggled with as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, what we need to understand is my dad was a pioneer. He did things nobody else was doing. He absolutely changed the face of world missions today. He is credited with that because he had a holistic approach. My dad was an evangelist. Everywhere he went, he preached the gospel. He led millions of people to Christ. He was the Asian Billy Graham. He had the biggest meetings ever in many different countries. And everybody knew him. But if you were a child that was taken off the street and given a home and nurtured and educated and grew up knowing that Bob Pierce was your, in Korea, he was Abaji, father. And he would go and visit the children and they would climb all over him and he would tell them stories. I have heard story after story after story from pastors who are my age now talking about how they would all get excited when Abhiji came, Bob Pierce came. Bob Pierce was the hand of God, but for them, he was like a savior. I mean, not spiritually, he'd point them to Jesus, but his was the hand that brought the food, the nourishment, the healing, built hospitals, built schools. So was my dad overwhelmed with the love and the appreciation and the gratitude and the things that he received overseas, it was hard to come home and take out the trash. It was hard to come home to a teenage daughter who was all pouty and weepy because her boyfriend didn't talk to her. It was hard to go from that to that or that to husband. And maybe he stayed away more than he should have because he never learned to make that transition. And I think that that's easy to understand. What would you say to someone who just expresses feeling like it's impossible for them to stop? There's just so much need. Uh, their organization maybe is struggling and they just feel there's, you know, there's children facing such difficult things and they just feel like it's impossible for me to take a break. It's, I just can't take a Sabbath and rest each week. I need to keep going. What, what would you say to them in that difficult, difficult situation? I would say that um, you're making yourself God. I don't believe that God really needs us to do these things. He allows us to be part of his work. And I think you have to trust that if God is speaking to you right now and you're feeling the tug on your heart that you need to slow down, you need to find a way to deal with some of these things that you know are happening in your family, or maybe your own health, maybe you're not healthy, you're exhausted, God did not desire you to burn out. If you don't have the joy in your ministry that you used to have, you don't feel God speaking to you the way you used to, that's because you're not in a humble place to hear. And I would say, start praying right now for God to show you how you let go of some things, how you come home and just spend time with your family. God, you say it's impossible. Is that a challenge to God? God, it's impossible for me to slow down. Well, what did we say? We, he is the God of the impossible. And he loves you. He wants you not to sacrifice your children on the altar of ministry or your marriage or your health. He will provide. Sometimes he provides in last minute ways like he did the goat or whatever it was, the sheep, the ram. But I would say to you, the most important thing you can do is admit your need. What is it to fix a problem 
the first thing you have to do is admit you have one. <laughs> admit you need to slow down. Admit you need to trust God and let go of some things. Admit you need to add some people to your staff. Even though, you know, it's going to be tight. They will bring things with them that you could never even imagine that will bless your ministry. Don't make the choice my dad did and do nothing. Or you may end up 63 years old with a lot of undone beautiful things. And God will just say, I can't use you anymore. You're burned out. Mm. Taking you home. Mm. And I know that's a harsh word for some people, but I actually believe it. And I feel led that there are people who are in despair right now, who with all the things going on in the world have watched their ministries wither and die. And you're in despair. And I would say to you, God is also the God of resurrection. Spend this time with him. Stop looking at what you've lost. Start asking for new vision and believing that, res that resurrection day is coming. And I really feel that's a word for someone. Mm. Thank you, Marilee. I, I do. I do think many, many people need to hear that. And perhaps to become reacquainted with their father and reacquainted with the reasons they came into this work in the first place, right? And Very good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. To understand that the God's invitation to us is is not to the relentless relentless exhaustion that simply uses us up and tosses us aside that yes. certainly pouring out is part of god's purpose right and and i do want to come to the end and be totally leave it all in the field and yet along that journey i have every confidence that that our good father also wants to give us times of refreshment and renewal each each week, which is why I think he established the Sabbath. Not not in a legalistic way, but he he didn't make us for Sabbath. He, he made the Sabbath as a gift to us. And uh, while we're not under the law and required to receive that gift, we're we're missing out and when we don't. And it it um, that that among other things is just one of his wonderful ways to pour in so that we can go the distance. And so that as we're doing it, we can do it with joy. Yeah, I think that that's so key. And what you said that just rang with me is I want to pour it all out and leave it on the altar. And we all feel that way. But you do not want to leave a string of dead bodies. You know, you don't want to pour out other people. Mm -hmm. You can pour you out. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to pour other people out. Mm -hmm. That's good. And I wasn't going to share this. And you don't have to if you feel it's too much. But if you read my book, you will understand that while my dad loved us, loved my sisters and me, and, and we were always on his heart. I've had so many people say to me, you have no idea how much your dad talked about you. You have no many idea. He was a man of prayer, how he would pray for his family. Prayers were great. In fact, he was proud of us to tell other people. Didn't tell us. I didn't know that because he didn't tell us. But he would tell other people. That's great. A lot of the reason that my parents' marriage uh, was broken. Guilt, sadness, the if onlys, the why didn't I, regret. And one of the things my dad said towards the end of his life was, no, he said to me, he had me. I, I went to see him. I was a mother by that time. I was 26. But he had me sit on his lap. He held me like I was a child, like he hadn't done when I was little. And he said, the only thing I regret is that you never knew your daddy. He knew he was dying from leukemia. That's a terrible regret. And I would ask that anyone listening to this broadcast understand it's not worth it. Think yes. about it, pray about it, do something about it. Mm. So important, Marilee. Yes, it is not worth it. And it is not what God asks of us. No, no, no. It is not God's will for you mm -hmm. and your family. Yeah, yeah. Jesus paid the price on the cross. Mm -hmm. 
so that we wouldn't have to. Yeah. And now we just get to join our Father in His work. It is not our work. It's not on our shoulders, right. ultimately. Yeah. And if we imagine that it is, we're taking on something God has not given us. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's an yeah. honor and a joy. Mm. Be obedient, but, you know, know that it, this is, if you're, if you're in the middle of God's will for your life, it's going to include rest. It's going to include uh, times with him. You know, the healthy place is balance. Everything in life is about balance understand God's balance for you. Mm. Marilee, I hadn't been planning to ask this question. We can leave it out if, you know, we ultimately decide to. But I, you know, transparently, one thing I've often wrestled with is the passage where Jesus very clearly says that a good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. And that, and yet in so many lives, and including my own, but I, I felt this so keenly in reading your book about your father. There was such good, good fruit and some very bad fruit, right? Side by side. How, how do you process those things being so interwoven? Well, I think because we're all human. And I think that when we plant those seeds of faith and scriptural truth, I mean, everything that God blessed was according to his word in my dad's life. Then when we plant the bad seed, I used to tell my children this when I'd put them in bed and we'd talk about things, talk about the day, and I'd say, be sure and plant good seed tomorrow because the good seed will produce flowers mm. and fruit and good things. But if you plant bad seed, you'll get weeds. Mm -hmm. We both do both. We all do both. And my dad did it on a world wide scale. Mm -hmm. My dad did nothing in a small way. He did everything big. Yeah. And so his vision was amazing. It was clear. It was huge. It was worldwide. But his blindness was also huge. Mm -hmm. There were blind spots. Yeah. And they basically produced some real hard things. Mm -hmm. And I think that God allows everything. Uh, you know, my story, our story is like a book of the Bible. My parents are like characters in the Bible. Yes. They're flawed. They're human. They sin. Look at what David did. Look at the ways Moses failed mm -hmm. and the disciples. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. good grief. Every single one minute, one minute Peter's walking on water and the next minute he's denying Christ. That's who we are. Yes. And God understands that, and he will not condemn you for it. But you will reap what you sow. Mm. Just because we're Christians, that doesn't mean that changes. What a, what a, what a vital truth to remember. Both the, 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 the law of sowing and reaping, and yet also knowing that God's grace is underneath it all and so much larger than even the biggest mistakes we can make. And I, I think one of the things that is that I would say is be, be someone who hears and is a doer. Don't hear this message and shrug it off. Do something about it mm. if God is tugging at your heart. Now, some of you are doing okay. And you're thinking, I can think of five people who need to hear this message. <laughs> Pass it on. But if God's tugging at your heart in any way about this, don't shrug it off. Because it's the people who hear and do. Mm -hmm. Who not only save themselves a lot of heartache, and grow in Christ and become more usable to God. You know, you want to be usable to God. If you're living a healthy life, God will use you in ways you can't imagine. But if you can't be obedient in the little things, and some people think, well, my marriage, my kids, what does that compare to the world? Huge. God was going to kill Moses. Make sure you've circumcised your kids. You've done the things that you need to do at home. You know, the word tells us that you're worse than an infidel. 
if you don't take care of your faith. Well, Marilee, last question here. Um, if you could sit down with your dad in his 20s, perhaps, or th early 30s, you know, vibrant young man, passionate for the Lord, earnest to go out and change the world, and you had a chance to just speak to him earnestly and give him advice for engaging that work, yes, doing it, but mm -hmm. doing it in a different way, how, how would you encourage him in that? Well, I, I think I would say the same things I've been saying. Dad, uh, I know your passion. And I, I think, you know, I think about it. Everybody around my dad had this big vision. It was a competition. Don't, don't, I mean, these were regular guys. And my dad even says before he was originally sent overseas for the first time to China by Youth for Christ as an evangelist. But the real reason he got to go is because everybody else that were the A-listers, my dad was a B-lister on the roster, Billy Graham. And there were others whose names you would not know today because they didn't last. But there was a whole roster of shining stars, the up and coming world changers. And they had already been sent out to Europe and other places. And the guy that was supposed to go to China couldn't go at the last minute. So they came to Bob Pierce and said, Bob, will you go like next week? And he was so excited. But he was honest enough to know that he wasn't their choice. Later, you could look back and say he was God's choice. But there was competition. There was a sense that he wasn't as good as and having to prove yourself and all of those things. And I would have said to him, Daddy, no, you're good enough. Don't let the enemy of our souls tell you you have to earn anything. Be obedient, but be humble. Listen to the people who really love you. And that's going to be your wife and your children and your father-in-law, your mom, the people who really know who you are. Let people know who you really are. You don't have to always be on. You don't always have to have the answer. You don't always have to earn love. You're loved. And you're exactly who God made you to be. Don't try so hard. And let your family in. He didn't grow up in a family that taught him how to do that. A lot of us don't. Let God teach you what it means to be part of a family. And hold on to that like the dearest treasure of your life. And all these things will be added unto you. I don't know if you would have heard it. But honestly, I think that's what I would have said. Well, so many other people need to hear that too. In fact, I'd say all of us on some level. We need to be reminded that our value, our identity, our worth does not come from what we can achieve, whether in ministry or anything else. And uh, just to know that we are God's beloved son, God's beloved daughter, long before we achieve anything, that can then be the most freeing thing in the world. And then we can join God in his work and pour it out and leave it all on the field. Yeah. But with a sense yeah. of, of lightness and joy rather than burden and exhaustion. I think so. And I think the to be very, very uh, uh, disciplined to always give it back. Give it back to him. Give it back. Let go. Let go. Give it back. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have had things in my life where I've been before God praying, oh God, you know, I need you to do this. I need you to bless this. I need you to, and, and, and my hands will be clenched. And God will say to me, Marilee, let it go. Mm. Open your hands. Every good and perfect hand comes from my hand. But I can't give you anything 
when your hands are closed and clenched. Let it go. Give it back. Trust that I'll take good care of it. And you know, that has been one of the greatest struggles I've had in my life. And one of the greatest joys of my life because mm. it's such a relief mm. to let it go. Mm. Well, what a wonderful word to end on. And I, even as we do, I just I would encourage anyone who's even listening right now with and just, you know, take your hands and they are they may be clenched around something. Even if you can't tell, they're probably gripping something tightly and just release and open those hands before the Lord and. Once again, re-remember that he has all things in his great hands, so we do not need to clench and grasp. Thank you, Marilee. Thank you. Thank you. This has been delightful. Thank you so much. What a powerful, powerful story. And as Marilee suggested, I felt that it carried so much of the feel of the texture of a biblical story of Moses or Deborah or David or Peter. Bob Pierce was a man of such passion and vision, and so much good came through his life. And yet, right alongside that were so many blind spots that had such tragic consequences, both for his own life and ministry and for those nearest to him. And of course, we all know that we are made of the same clay, that we can be self-deceived. We can fall into so many of those same pits as well, even amidst, perhaps especially amidst very, very good work, very good causes and much passion for God and his kingdom. So I would encourage you very much, as Merrily did, that if God has been stirring something in your heart, if you feel he's been challenging you, challenging you on something, don't let the moment pass. Act on it. Maybe that means working to find one or more people who can provide serious accountability, both encouragement as well as challenge in your life. Maybe it's going to your family, spouse and children or others and saying, how am I doing? Where am I loving you well and where do you feel I'm falling short? What needs to be different? Or perhaps it's setting into your life a regular rhythm of Sabbath so that once each week you can enter into the rest and refreshment and play and worship that God intends for his children. Or perhaps it's something else entirely. I will leave that up to you. But as we wrap up here, I would really encourage you after this ends to take just a few moments to perhaps close your eyes if you're in a place where you can do that and close your hands and then release and open them. Open your hands before God and ask him to release those things that you have been holding tightly to, to help you to do that, knowing that he will take them because he ultimately has you and all things in his good and capable hands. You've been listening to Justice and the Inner Life with Jed Menefit, a production of the Christian Alliance for Orphans. To learn more about the Alliance, visit us online at capo.org.